This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. The Uyghurs of East Turkestan, a people brutalized these last decades by the People's Republic of China. And part of the story is that brutality. The other part of the story is why it took so long for this fact to be established in the United States, in Europe, and around the world. I welcome a man who has been a great aid in getting the news out. He is a Uyghur. He was born in East Turkestan, AKA Xinjiang. His name is Nuri Turkle. The new book is No Escape, the true story of China's genocide of the Uyghurs. Nuri's at the Hudson Institute. He's also vice chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Nuri, congratulations and good evening. I begin with the story that you tell of Abdu Vali Ayyub. In 1998, a young scholarly man reading and writing in two languages, Mandarin, the Chinese language, and the also speaking Uyghur, the Uyghur language. And that gives him an advantage. And he's hired in Xinjiang, in the large city, by Zhu Hailan. Who is Zhu Hailan and what does Abdavali make of him in those days of late 20th century. Good evening to you. Good evening to you, John. If I may, um, I'd like to uh, thank you and your team for uh, giving me a platform uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, I can't believe it's been that long since we've known each other. I don't know how many times I appeared on your show um, and allowing me to uh, shine a spotlight uh, early on discussing some of the uh, human rights abuses now turned into a full swing genocide and crimes against humanity. Um, I, I am profoundly grateful uh, to you and your listeners for paying attention to this um, uh, 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 genocide, a modern day genocide, a tech genocide that is happening uh, on World's Watch. Um, disturbingly, this genocide is in its sixth year. Zhu Hailun is... Um, is a brutal um, uh, individual who had a, who had a mission uh, to destroy the Uyghur nation. He started with a very innocuous, uh, harmless process of learning the Uyghur language uh, embedded in the Uyghur community, identifying strengths and weaknesses of the Uyghur people. And then he turned into uh, someone that the Uyghur people uh, feared of. Uh, he turned into something a, um, a, a modern uh, comparison, I would say something, someone like uh, Adolf Heitman, uh, who not only uh, helped to uh, enforce the brutal policies of the central government, the Communist Party, but also shaped the local environment, um, uh, going after something as innocuous as the local culture, calling it feudal, feudal culture. So those of us who follow uh, the politics, the events, in Tibet have heard this term, feudal means um, it's a slur. Uh, that means that you're backward, you're outdated, and your culture is uh, inferior to that of the uh, majority Han Chinese. So this man um, uh, rightfully sanctioned by the United States government. One of the uh, main uh, characters in my book, uh, Mr. Abduli Ayub, a Uyghur scholar poet who studied in Kansas early on and decided to make a, 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 made a fateful decision to return to the homeland uh, to uh, revive the Uyghur culture, Uyghur language. Before he do that, uh, he did that. Um, he was working for this brutal individual, Zhu Hailun, uh, in the 19, late 1990s. Uh, he was a young uh, college graduate. He witnessed. Uh, he was the acting translator for this individual uh, in Kashgar. And he, he even uh, noticed something so odd with him, uh, such as you know, uh, going around uh, showing up with his uh, a giant dog, uh, even his presence, his brutality, his mindset, his sadistic uh, views, um, taking pleasure of uh, torturing other people were not enough. He had this uh, a, a big entourage uh, driving around the city Let's tell the story, Nuri, that day that Abdul Valley witnesses the black Toyota Land Cruiser show up at a village that's been told to prepare for the visit of Zhu Hailan. And yes. everybody cleans up everything they can to make it presentable, which is a false face, but they're intimidated for 
uh, for the bully boys. And one man who does not know about the arrival of Zhu Hailan comes up the road uh, with his cart and his mule, I picture. What happens? So he's uh, he's like this is very relevant to uh, today's um, and uh, stories, um, as 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 uh, some of you listeners might be aware that um, uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, Michelle Bachelet has been planning to go to uh, uh, Uyghur homeland, East Turkestan, and they're doing exactly what uh, Joe Highland was expecting the local people to do: uh, cleaning up, uh, getting everything in order. Uh, lining up, uh, showing some rosy picture, essentially a Potemkin village. But his purpose was very, very um, specific. He wanted to carry out two month long nightmare, uh, nighttime house raid, search farmers uh, for illicit uh, books such as works on Uyghur history. Um, and he, he also very um, uh, uh, brutal uh, in a way that he was speaking the Mandarin, which is not a known uh, way of communication to the local people. So Abdulli's job was to translate uh, and, and even including some of the renting. Um, and then he wants to make sure that the translation does not miss out any, any word that he spelled out. So, so this man um, is, is, is an emblematic uh, of what we're seeing today. Whenever some uh, senior leadership from the, uh, the Communist Party of Prachek, either from Beijing, either from Rimchi, shows up, they need to clean, do a massive cleaning, uh, uh, create a, a very happy, prosperous um, uh, environment to showcase. So, so this was not this, this is something that the, the international community seen today, uh, journalists, uh, some friendly governments uh, from the Muslim majority countries, and now the UN official, top UN official is in charge of, uh, for human rights, will be seeing this kind of Potemkin village of setup. The old man is beaten by the gangsters and Abduvali is shocked. Soon afterwards, there's a meeting in which Abduvali presents a petition saying your conduct is unacceptable. These people are being brutalized and he's fired. 13, uh, 15 years later, Abduvali is in Xinjiang, our poet, teaching kindergartners how to speak the language, how to uh, be artful and understand the language they were born with. He's arrested and thrown into a prison and beaten and sexually abused by the present day guards and, brut and brutes who, who are dominating the picture in Kashgar and Urumqi. And one guard leans forward and says what to him, Nuri? The... Um, um... The, the one thing that uh, the, 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 the scenery is, I mean, it just, it's hard to explain, uh, describe the brutality of this pen. One um, a common response uh, before he was coming, there was actually a song, which uh, essentially goes along the lines of Joe Highland is coming. Old lady fix your eyebrows with a mascara, mascara. Old man throw away your cane. Kids, no breaks at school. Teachers, don't put your head scar. Clean up your bathroom. Joe Highland is coming. That's how fearful that uh, the local Uyghur people are. So this man uh, essentially uh, created this, this nightmarish uh, environment. Even his presence uh, with his G German shepherd uh, is, is, is enough uh, tools to scare the local people. I'm just laughing through tears that I can't imagine anyone, uh, let alone an ordinary a farmer, a villager, seeing this kind of uh, environment. Abdulli Ayyub um, is, an, is a remarkable human being. Uh, when I interviewed him, uh, he told me some of the things uh, that he had witnessed in his interactions and, and working for this guy. See, so, you know, he cited something like, uh, when he talk, was talking about the, uh, the Uyghur's spirituality, uh, he said something like, these people like to think that God tells them to do this and that, but your God is such a dick. He just, he uses such a offensive language to malign, slander, uh, humiliate, dehumanize the Uyghur people who are defenseless. Abdulli Ayyub um, now lives in Norway. Uh, he's a political refugee. 
as someone who grew up in such a conservative uh, environment myself, I cannot wrap my head around the idea that he was courageous enough to go public and tell all of the brutality, including sexual violence that he experienced. And, you know, some of the things that he told me was so riveting that um, much of the things that he heard from um, Zhu Hailun during that period was so offensive that he just wanted to punch him. Right. But he had no choice but to translate those slurs, those offensive words uh, to, to facilitate this guy's uh, brutal uh, engagements or uh, 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 actions in the, on the ground. Abdulvali is tortured and eventually finds a way out. And we're glad for that. However, we're going to go back farther than 1998. We're going to go back to 1970, the year of Nuri Turkle's birth. The book is No Escape, The True Story of China's Genocide of the Uyghurs. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Nuri was born in a prison camp. His mother, Aisha, why was she in prison? Why was she being abused by the guards, Nuri? Simply put, uh, guilt by association. Um, my mother is a remarkable uh, a woman. Um, a, 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 and, and anyone can say uh, things like that about their mother, and they should. But my mother was um, remarkable in many aspects. One, um, she was very aware of the uh, political environment early on. Uh, supporting my uh, maternal grandfather, who was uh, politically very active and involved in the uh, Second East Turkestan Republic. That's what that was established in 1944 and dismantled uh, uh, by Mao's China with the help of Stalin's Soviet Union. That national sentiment, uh, longing for independent state, uh, was part of the Uyghur people and the society. My grandfather was very influential uh, a businessman. Uh, he had a jewelry store. Um, and he was, a, he was a musician and he had uh, family and friends uh, gathered at uh, my maternal grandparents' house. And my mom was a cheap host, uh, opening the door, greeting and sending them out. So the Chinese noted that my, my mom uh, had a very special connection to this nationalist individual who was my uh, grandfather. And uh, at the start of the uh, uh, Cultural Revolution, the Red Guards uh, rounded up Uyghurs, much like the way they started rounding up in late 2016 and 2017. So they took my mother into um, re-education camp uh, where she was uh, pregnant at the time. And, and then not only that, uh, they took my grandfather into another re-education re camp. Uh, as if those are not enough uh, punishment, they sent my father university graduated educator to forced labor camps where he spent three years um, doing performing uh, agricultural labor. When my mom was incarcerated, um, she was subject to um, verbal and physical abuses. Uh, as I noted, she's from a very traditional conservative family. Uh, even uh, it, making uh, horrible comments about her belly, beating her up, uh, calling her names by a prison guard, was enough torture for her. Uh, during that period, she got physical injury that ended up being, um, that, that uh, resulted in cast on her um, body, uh, around her torso, um, her legs. Uh, she delivered me while she was uh, in uh, cast chest down. After I was born, uh, one would hope that they will let us go, but uh, I spent the first several months of my life in this world uh, with my young mother, uh, in this re-education camp in a giant uh, Soviet build, uh, building uh, where my dad was away. Uh, and my, during that time, I remember mom was telling me that uh, there's a crack in the window um, uh, through the woods, uh, wood panels that she always uh, bring me to the uh, panel, close to the panel to, with the hope that I might be able to uh, get some natural sunlight. She might be able to have a glimpse of her mom shows up uh, at the gate uh, occasionally uh, with the hope that my mom and myself uh, will be out for uh, daily rec time. And this is 1970. This is yeah. before yes. the present regime that is persecuting the Uyghurs now. Yes. So, so what we're looking at is a continuum, not something that happened after China became prosperous. This was true when China was in the grips of the, the Red Guard and 
the Cultural Revolution, 1970. Your father was condemned for intoxication, intoxication with Soviet ideology, a quite fantastic charge. Absolutely. And, and my father's um, crime, quote unquote, was also quite remarkable. It's something that relates to what is happening to the Uyghur people today. Uh, my dad had uh, relatives. Um, they passed away. Um, I recently been in, Uzbe in Uzbekistan um, and knowing that I, my family's uh, ordeal, my specifically my family, my dad's ordeal then somewhat related to that country. I had such an interesting uh, feeling when I was there on top of uh, uh, hearing the news that my father passed away while I was in there on the official trip. The, the relevance is this. And today, um, if you have a travel history to 26 countries, ironically, that also includes Uzbekistan, there's a chance for you to be end up in a concentration camp is pretty high. Uh, there are 26 countries that includes the United States, Germany, Turkey, all the stands in, uh, in Central Asia. So my dad's crime was essentially uh, having a relative and occasionally listening to a Uyghur program uh, broadcast uh, 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 through uh, uh, satellite radio uh, broadcasted from the other side of the border. Uh, my dad um, is an intellectual, Uyghur intellectual, and he was in Kashgar uh, under a government program to educate the local people after he graduated from the Xinjiang University in 1961. He um, he, he is not as politically aware as my mother, and yet he was just an educator. He probably likes to play chess, writes, likes to write poet, uh, likes to um, hang out with his friends, um, just to, you know, any academic that you can think of in the United States. Um, and the, 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 the important aspect that you raise is something worth noting. People oftentimes uh, think when they read the headline uh, in our uh, newspapers or watch programs on TV or listen to the program uh, on radio, the, the, the reaction is that oh, Uyghurs must have done something wrong so that Xi Jinping's China reacted. Um, it's not. This has been ongoing uh, repression and persecution as long as I have been breathing for. And as, as long as I have a, I have a, as long as I remember. The the, my life, the, the, the fact that I named this book uh, No Escape uh, speaks volume. And because I've seen all of it, I started my life in a re-education camp and I'm fighting against the similar type camp that the Xi Jinping's China set up uh, at an industrial you, scale. Let me get you to the United States quickly because when we come back, we're going to explore the brutality of these last years. Nuri Turkle left China in the 1990s for education made a decision to go to law school in the United States, moved to Washington, D.C., and we're speaking to him there now, has become active as a Uyghur leader since these last this last decade. We're going to go into what Nuri's been convincing the whole world, not just uh, the United States, but the whole world has been going on in Uyghur by using media and by writing about it. When we come back, Nuri Turkle's book is No Escape, the true story of China's genocide of the Uyghurs. Genocide is a strong word. We're going to demonstrate very clearly in several anecdotes by brave young women, how they stood up to the persecution and the brutality, the mass murder of the Chinese Communist Party towards the Uyghurs. Nuri, you write of three women, Zumrat, uh, Miragal, and uh, Kel a binner, all three for different reasons are imprisoned by the Chinese Communist Party. My guess is sometime after 2016, the persecution seems to have accelerated starting around 2015, 2016. Uh, the reason they're persecuted is not as important as how they're persecuted. China's agents, and we named one of the most harsh ones, Zhu Hailan, China's agents are are charged with erasing the Uyghur people? How to, how to put this, Nuri? Their, their devotion to how many children the Uyghurs have and how the young women could have more children. So they devote themselves to removing the ability of young women of, of born Uyghur from having children. Is that the way to say it? That's, the, that's precisely the way to say it. And it's, uh, it's an accurate portrayal of what's happening uh, to Uyghur women. 
I, I decided to highlight the Uyghur women and children's uh, uh, struggle to survive in this world because of the historical re relevance to the uh, uh, Jewish people and the Roma's experienced uh, during the uh, Nazi era. Uh, when you look at the initial um, objective, um, unstated goal um, of the Chinese Communist Party, they just wanted to destroy this nation. So it just bothers me so much when people still debate whether or not this is a genocide. When a government purposefully uh, systematically uh, creates an environment and forcibly prevent national po natural population growth significantly, where we're talking about in one year, 25% decline. And this is one of the key factors that the United States government, Secretary Pompeo initially decided uh, and determined that this is a genocide. Uh, you know, what, why would you uh, force a 50-year-old woman or middle-aged woman, as I profiled in my book, to go through a forced sterilization. This is Kalbunur. Kalbunur. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Kalbunur was not planning to have a baby. And uh, Zumrat Dawud was, uh, you know, just enjoying God's gift as a child uh, uh, when she got pregnant. But because of the prerequisite of three years, she was forced to go through uh, forced abortion. And, and today, um, Zumrat Dawud is still experiencing in Northern Virginia, lots of health issues because of that brutality that she was um, forced to go through. She cannot conceive a child anymore. Uh, this, is, this is an ongoing, the, in addition to the forced sterilization, uh, we live in a country that people debate whether abortion should be uh, legal or illegal. But what, what we're dealing in communist China is forced uh, sterilization and late-term forced abortion and systematic destruction of a natural, prevention of natural population growth. It's as if they're frightened of babies. That's absolutely, it, absolutely. It, and also- the baby, not, Babies would be a failure on the part of the brutes if babies yes. are born. Yes, and then in the book, um, there's a, a story uh, told by uh, Mihrugul. She, she said that there was a young, beautiful uh, movie star uh, looked like uh, a young girl were taken out of her cell every day uh, and, and uh, apparently subject to uh, rape. Uh, in one instance, one of the camp survivors here in Washington, who is not in the book, told BBC that she was even tortured after tortured with electric stick after she was gang raped. So a gang rape, um, forced sterilization, forced abortion, this mysterious pills that the female prisoners were uh, forced to take. Oh my God, I don't know what, uh, what else uh, a government could and should do to get your attention. So, so the, the American people, uh, the global community must understand this regime that we're dealing with, trying to normalize in some instance is a genocidal regime. And also another aspect, you know, a, a father of two young kids, myself, um, every day, um, it's not an exaggeration. I feel like I'm aged uh, in the last few years, just hearing these horrible stories, hor uh, harrowing uh, experiences, uh, and, and knowing that how important for mothers to be able to hold their child, uh, children. Based on credible reports, 800,000 to 1 million Uyghur children have been forcibly removed from their families and given to Han Chinese for adoption, or given to the Chinese state-run orphanages uh, this American Life on NPR uh, profiled a Uyghur father in Turkey who recognized his son in a TikTok uh, video, a promotional video by the Chinese state, uh, essentially suggesting that these are wonderful facilities that the kids have a better future. Any of uh, I mean, those of us who is history, a student of history know the Hitler did the same, same thing similar, focusing on Jewish women and children. So when you don't have the children, when you have, uh, don't have the uh, woman, mother, what kind of nation can you expect to have? So this is, this is a true evil nature of Communist Party, uh, able to commit this kind of uh, crimes against a vulnerable individuals and members of our society. Let's Women anticipate what uh, people hearing this story for the first time are going to ask. Do the Chinese people know? Do the billion people who are not in Xinjiang, because we're talking about a little more than 13 million people worldwide, this is not a populist society, but it has a high birth rate because of culture. Good for it. 
and high birth rates make people prosperous. That's the way it works everywhere in the world. The more young people you have, the more the more prosperous you're going to be. But there you 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 present a young woman named Victoria Shu. I believe that's how you say her name. Vicky Shu. Yeah, and when she leaves China and goes to Australia for the first time and learns what's happening in China, she doesn't believe it. She thinks people are being lied to. She's 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 a she's another individual that I I deeply admire. Um, along with Shan Zhang, a Chinese uh, student in, in Vancouver who identified the camps through his technical skills. And Vicky is a remarkable uh, Chinese uh, journalist uh, by training. She, um, she initially hated everything about the Uyghurs. She, she has zero interest. In one instance, she told me over the phone that, uh, Nuri, I was train trained to hate people like yourself. She was supposed to be a, a, one of the a key propaganda uh, uh, a project or individual trained by the Chinese state. And now she is, has uh, become the one of the strongest voices, uh, critical voices. She is largely responsible for the first uh, forced labor uh, uh, report produced by Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, she's in Australia now, but the, the, Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party intimidates, threatens, and challenges people who tell the truth, such as Nuri Turkle. And Nuri's family is threatened. You're routinely reminded what could happen. You can be cut off. There are so many stories, but I want to go to slave labor. Because what happens after the prison experience is that the Chinese Communist Party has decided to use the Uyghurs working in two industries chiefly. One is textile and the other is solar panels. Uh, these are people called surplus labor. How does it work, Nuri? Before I, I answer the question, I'd like to mention, uh, speaking of the Chinese society, the, um, uh, you know, there's a, something called a, a Brave New War, uh, Order, uh, World Order in China in 1984. Today's Chinese society is a combination of uh, uh, George Orwell's 1984 and uh, a Brave New World, um, which is essentially the combination of North Korea and the United States. It is like North Korea because of the Orwellian surveillance. Uh, as we know today, uh, uh, based on credible reports, 41 cities and 290, uh, uh, 290 million people in 41 cities, it's essentially one, uh, one third of the workforce have been in lockdown. So when the Chinese government um, uh, says that, oh, we want to do, have a zero COVID policy, that comes as a price. Uh, contact tracing, every aspect of the Chinese people's activities, communications, engagements are monitored, surveilled. That makes it a perfect example for 1984 Orwellian society. And the other type that um, the, the privileged ones that benefit from the trade, you know, technological boom, uh, making themselves billionaires, millionaires, uh, going to LA, uh, Paris, uh, New York for shopping, uh, uh, wine tasting, uh, sending their kids to elite schools. And those are the ones who are don't, uh, in a position to make difference, but and yet they don't want to do anything because they don't want to be part of that Orwellian uh, society member. Their life is too good for them. So essentially the Chinese people living, uh, as this Chinese novelist Yang Lian Ke said in 2018, uh, living in China is confusing now, he said, because it feels, it can feel like being living, being in North Korea and the United States at the same time. Because of this environment, we don't hear people on the ground even saying something the slightest of a critical of uh, Xi Jinping's China. In fact, uh, based on various reports and conversation, read I read and conversation that I had, uh, vast majority of people seem to be okay with Xi Jinping's policy. As for the other point that is uh, critically important and uh, very relevant to um, our fellow Americans here at home. The United States, uh, in, in the face of all of the policy announcements, uh, decisions, sanctions, uh, entity list designation, uh, and legislative mandate, remains to be the largest export destination for Xinjiang exports. The reason being that uh, during the period of um, poverty alleviation in China, China has uh, got a lot of, of own citizens out of poverty. Um, and at the same time, that uh, project uh, created a huge labor shortage. So what do they do? Uh, they need to look for this vulnerable group. 
they need to keep them busy so that there will not be a political conversation in their daily lives. There will not be a resentment, a room for resentment. If you just work and go home, eat, sleep, then you have no space in your brain to talk about other stuff. So this, this slave labor system that the China set up uh, serves China's uh, political economy as well as, as well as political objective at the same time. And we are in the Western societies as a consumers of those products, essentially funding the ongoing genocide. Based on Vicky Shi's report, uh, there are uh, more than 80 global brands, including much of the stuff that we use in our lives in the United States, clothes, electronic components, solar panels, uh, and PPEs, disturbingly. Uh, in 2020, there was a report in New York Times uh, showing the uh, assembly line making PPEs to save lives in the United States. So everything that the American people touch today, this is not an exaggeration, this is not a hyperbole. There's a, anyone who's interested who can go to visit this website uh, and the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Coalition website to see how many brands, what kind of brands that we everyday touch, make our babies to wear, uh, have been uh, made by uh, Uyghur slaves, essentially Chinese government, uh, Chinese entities through this very subtle political economic uh, objective oriented policies uh, polluted the global supply chain with tainted consumer products made by modern day slaves, the Uyghurs. Nuri Turkle is the author of No Escape, the true story of China's genocide of the Uyghurs. What is to be done? We're going to turn to these last years and Nuri and his colleagues have established protocols and methods to push back very hard and also to communicate what is going on now, what we can know is going on now because of the few brave people who've escaped. The persecution begins in the 20th century during the time of the Cultural Revolution. It accelerates in the early decade of the 21st century, but then the brutality is industrialized in the second decade. Nuri, working in Washington with his colleagues, bringing this to the attention of the world, sometimes challenged because early on in the war on terror, the Uyghurs were identified as possibly contributing to Islamic radicalism. However, by the second decade, and now we're into the third decade of the 21st century, Nuri and his colleagues have been successful. I want to note some of the successes here. There's the better cotton industry that includes H&M and Nike and other distinguished brands who push back and they get kicked in the face. The Chinese wolf warriors uh, take on major industries as well. It doesn't matter to the Chinese. They'll punish you initially to see if you uh, back off. Nori, however, has met members of government. During the Trump administration, I wanna mention one particular member of the National Security Council, Matt Pottinger. What did Matt and you cook up, Nori? How have you worked together these last years? Uh, thank you very much for asking that uh, important question, you know, that, um, that I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit in, in details. Uh, when we uh, hear the news or read about uh, human rights abuses, oftentimes reactions, oh, here comes another um, human rights problem. Oftentimes people feel distant um, uh, that may cause a silence, you know, look the other way, or even some instance uh, as the business community has done, uh, feigning ignorance. Uh, in the previous administration, uh, there are several key policymakers, uh, officials, did something so remarkable, which, is, which was normalizing uh, a, a public, a healthy public discussion to call CCP out for what, you know, for its uh, brutal behaviors, uh, threats, uh, global threats, and uh, the genocidal policies. The, the, the Matt Pottinger and others um, set the stage and also uh, Matt Pottinger's, uh, the Matt Pottinger and others in the previous administration not only set the stage and normalize, helped to normalize this kind of public uh, healthy discussion, but also did something tangible. Back in 2019, 
uh, with Matt's uh, advocacy uh, of this policy response, the Trump administration uh, added a significant number of uh, China's entities into the entity list, Commerce Department's entity list. Remarkably, uh, the entire police department in Uyghur homeland, uh, the Chinese police entities, were added to the entity list. And one of them is happened to be the one that uh, at Disneyland, uh, Disney, uh, Walt Disney uh, Mulan movie credited uh, for its assistance uh, during the process of making that movie. That was the beginning. Um, as of today, because of these uh, wonderful visionary uh, policymakers, uh, government officials that we have in our country, the United States and uh, seven other countries condemn the uh, Chinese atrocities against the Uyghurs as genocide and crime against humanity, crimes against humanity. Uh, on top of that, uh, starting with 2019, uh, October 2019, I saw the picture of Matt with President Trump when he signed off that decision. Uh, we have over 100 uh, punitive sanctions announced uh, by the United States government, including the most recent visa restriction uh, announced by uh, Secretary Blinken. So this is a bipartisan uh, nightmare to the Chinese. The Chinese never thought that uh, Trump administration and Biden administration will take a similar position. Even early uh, in 2021, uh, the Biden administration took the matter to Europe and um, uh, uh, highlighted this issue at the G7. And before that, there was a coordinated concerted uh, sanctions announced by EU, UK, Canada, and the United States. And last year, something remarkable happened that uh, the, the United States uh, Congress passed a bipartisan bicameral uh, a bill, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. That was signed into law by President, Trump, uh, President Biden. Uh, around that time, the US government also announced diplomatic boycott. In retaliation, the Chinese uh, state, the uh, Chinese government, sanctioned me and three other uh, commissioners that I served with. Seven out of nine commissioners that I've been ser uh, have served along at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom have been sanctioned. We've been sanctioned. I, I, I want to mention that Nancy Pelosi who appointed you to this committee, very important uh, commi commission on international religious freedom. And when I first learned about it, I thought, what? Nuri's hit the big time ever since, Nuri. It's wonderful because we get to speak not just of the Uyghurs, but all religious persecution. Absolutely. You know, the, the beauty of, um, uh, of being in this country and being in this role and I always said that this only happens in America, that I was appointed by Speaker Pelosi, a Democratic leader, and I've been able to work with uh, the Trump administration officials, including uh, former Vice President Mike Pence, who had uh, had me in his office to uh, discuss these issues with me. And so, on the last day of the Trump administration, something important happened. We yeah. have just about 30 seconds. Go ahead. Nora. Yeah, and the last day of the Trump administration, uh, former Secretary uh, State uh, Pompeo uh, formally announced that uh, what is happening in uh, to the Uyghur people is a genocide and crimes against humanity. Around the same time, the incoming Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken said uh, told the Congress that that would be his uh, determination or judgment. And not only that, uh, he uh, formalized this in, in a number of occasions, including the annual human rights um, uh, report. So this is a this is you know this something relates to what is happening today to the Chinese uh, regime uh, Xi Jinping the uh, global alliance uh, the bipartisan spirit in defense of democratic values human rights religious freedom is a dreadful proposition and now the world is starting to come along why religious freedom is so important my job when Speaker Pelosi as office reached out. Uh, I was so pleased. And she sa essentially said that, you know, I want to elevate the Uyghur cause through your work at the commission. And two, I want to help. I want you to help build bipartisan coalition. We cannot tolerate this kind of behavior in Beijing. And the place to begin is with the book, No Escape, the true story of China's genocide of the Uyghurs. Nuri Turkle is the author. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor.